morning, Tima. Uh, let me. How is the storm hitting you, or is it not yet there? Oh, it's, uh, we had a lot of rain overnight. It's okay now. How about you? Yeah. So I suppose uh, we'll speak for 45 minutes, and then there will be discussions, etc.? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll wait. Let's wait another, like, four or five minutes. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. And we'll start. Uh, but, yeah. Um, any format like any anything will is right um, and um, you know people if they chime in during the talk maybe we can depending on how it is there'll be like a we'll have a, a chat screen so it's yeah great all questions till the end whatever your preferences thank you again thank you for organizing it's cool Good morning, everyone. We're going to wait until like 8.02, 8.03, and then we'll begin. Um, thanks for joining.
Hey everybody, um, thanks again for joining. Uh, we, um, we're excited to host this session today. Um, again, um, we're going to start in like a minute. I think there's some people filtering in. Um, if um, we're going to, obviously we're going to talk about neuroembryology. Uh, we are super excited to welcome Dr. Krings back uh, for another lecture. He must have been um, an amazing partner and a mentor of mine and we go back a long way um, from the time of whatever to before our banana course when I asked Tima what you know how to help put it together and so forth and so it's been a really um, an amazing um, um, partnership uh, for me um, and um, um, I'm sure uh, any of you uh, know Dr. Krings as well. So um, what we're gonna do um, is um, start with a lecture by Timo. Um, please, if you have any questions, comments, etc., you could uh, jump in, um, you could like, either um, say something or wait until the end. There's also the Zoom chat thing, the Zoom group chat. You could, questions or comments there, we'll be looking at that. Uh, after Timo's lecture, we'll go into some cases, uh, mixed cases, some cases from our participants, some cases that make like hi can highlight more of the embryology concepts we're you know we're gonna we want to show today. It's obviously a very important topic at the core of a lot of uh, what um, you know what we teach and what is necessary to know. So anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, let me turn this over to Timo. All right, um, Timo, can you, um, you could, uh, I think you should be able to start sharing your screen anytime. Well, are you able to see my screen? Yes. yes. Perfect. So uh, thank you very much, Maxime and Aiton, uh, for putting all of this uh, together and thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. Um, I will speak about the uh, like really basics of uh, how uh, our vessels uh, develop. So I will speak about angiogenesis and vasculogenesis. And uh, I will then go into uh, the applications of um, this for our neurovascular world. So it sounds a bit esoteric uh, uh, at the beginning, but you will see that there are a couple of um, diseases that help us uh, or where uh, the concepts of angiogenesis and vasculogenesis will help us to understand why their uh, diseases are forming, why we have certain complications, and uh, how to avoid them. And um, the first time that I got in contact with this type of uh, thinking was a long time ago, uh, actually in 2004, when uh, I went uh, to the Chiang Mai course of uh, um, Pierre Lajunias at this point in time, and it was Heather Etchevers uh, who gave uh, a lecture on this topic and uh, I thought what what does this have to do with our daily work and I want to learn how to coil I want to learn how to embolize an AVM but the more and the longer that I've been now working in this field uh, the more it's getting interesting especially now with our uh, improved knowledge about the genetics for example of AVMs about uh, the newly uh, found somatic mutations that we find in uh, AVMs, about HHT and AVMs. And it does help, presumably for the future generations, uh, to um, uh, find ways to uh, deal with these challenging malformations. So in my outline, we will first discuss a little bit about what is angiogenesis, what is vasculogenesis. We will then talk about their growth factors. 
uh, we'll go in deeper details into the processes involved in vascular genesis and in angiogenesis, and we'll divide this into the embryonic and the postnatal angiogenesis. We discuss about one important feature of angiogenesis, the so-called angiogenic switch. And then uh, half of the talk, we will try uh, to discuss a little bit the applications of uh, all of these items. So first off, some definitions. Vascular genesis only appears once in your lifetime, i.e. when you're in utero, and it means that uh, you have new endothelial tubes develop de novo. Uh, i.e. Uh, from your progenitor cells, you will have, uh, due to the interplay of various growth factors, the vascular endothelial growth factors, the angiopoietins, and uh, the TGF beta pathway, the development of uh, primary endothelial cells that will form a primitive vascular network. This process here is called vascular genesis. And everything else after this is called angiogenesis, i.e. angiogenesis is the formation of new blood vessels from already pre-existing ones. And this can be due to remodeling or sprouting. And there's vascular genesis occurs only once in your lifetime. Angiogenesis occurs during your entire lifetime from like in utero all the way uh, to uh, the body's death. So in vascular genesis, endothelial cells differentiate and proliferate within a primary avascular tissue. And this is due to the fact that due to the uh, missing oxygen at one point in time, due to hypoxemia, uh, you have uh, in this avascular tissue, the formation of uh, hypoxemia inducible factor HIF alpha. This will lead to an increase in VEGF and this will lead to a new endothelial cell formation. These endothelial cells will coalesce and form a primary or primitive tubular network that will then further differentiate into the arterial side, the aorta, and the venous side, the major veins, and there will be a plexus in between. This plexus in between will then be remodeled, and this is already like in the angiogenic form. It will be remodeled in two ways certain arteries and veins will get larger. These are the arteries and veins that are present in an area that has very little oxygen, i.e. where we need more blood vessels. And certain vessels will no longer be needed within this primary tubular network. And this is a process called pruning, i.e. certain vessels, if there is no VEGF, i.e. if there is no necessity for getting oxygen to this specific portion of the tissue, these vessels will slowly regress. Once the vessels have remodeled, the vessel walls need to mature, i.e. from this very fluent or plastic state, the vessels need to become into a more mature or stable state. And this means that the endothelial cells need to be integrated with smooth muscle cells and parasites. And since we are growing, there will be areas of the body that will need more oxygen. And therefore, um, we will have an angiogenic sprouting from the existing vessels into the now newly developed avascular tissue due to the growth of the embryo. And this angiogenic sprouting has to go through a primary destabilization process, i.e. the mature blood vessels have to go into more primitive or destabilized or more plastic uh, form, and then can form new uh, sprouts going into the avascular tissue. Now, for all of this, we'll need growth factors. And um, there are multiple different growth factors. The ones that are important for vascular genesis and angiogenesis can be grouped into three different families of growth factors. The vascular endothelial growth factor family and a family means that there are multiple members of this family. So we have VGF, uh, like different types of VGFs. There's the angiopoietin family and then there's the efferin family. These three types of growth factors act on the endothelium. But there are other growth factors that act on other portions of the blood vessel. The non-endothelial growth factors are the TGF beta and the platelet-derived growth factor dependence uh, uh, factors, and they will uh, have to interplay and coordinate themselves with uh, those factors 
that act on the endothelium to form like our mature stable blood vessels. VEGF is the most critical driver of vascular formation as it initiates the formation of immature cells during the vascular genesis and then later on during the angiogenic sprouting. VEGF is regulated uh, by the oxygen tension. The oxygen tension in your tissue uh, up or down regulates hypoxia inducible factor and hypoxia inducible factor will directly act on VEGF, i.e. if you have low oxygen tension, HIF will be high and therefore VEGF will be high and this will lead to the formation of new sprouts into the area that uh, are hypoxemic. If you only give a, a VEGF without the additional endothelial cell, cell growth factors, i.e. without angiopoietin and without ephrine, you will have formation of vessels, but these vessels are immature, i.e. they are leaky and they will be unstable. And this will be of importance when we talk uh, later about, for example, bleeds that can form within these leaky or unstable vessels. In fact, if you have, on the other hand, mice that are engineered to have either no VEGF or where their major receptor, the VEGF receptor type 2, fails to develop, you have no vasculature, you have very few endothelial cells, and of course, these mice uh, cannot survive. A very good example of VEGF regulation, and here we are coming already into the applications of uh, VEGF, is uh, the retinal vascularization. In the normal retinal vascularization, you have an initially avascular and hypoxic rodent retina, and you get angiogenic sprouting into this retina. If you put those rodents, so if you put those mice under hyperoxia, then the retina will not be hypoxemic, but it will be hyperoxemic, and therefore there will be a cessation of vessel growth because it suppresses the formation of EGF. So you have, you continue to have an avascular retina. If you now return uh, the rodents to normoxia, now the retina is undervascularized, becomes hypoxic. VEGF will be upregulated, and this will lead to angiogenesis and leaky vessels. And unfortunately, this can not only be done in uh, experiments, obviously in mice, but it is happening uh, to babies who are uh, born immature, who are put into an incubator where, the high, uh, where they are under a hyperoxemic environment. And these babies can become blind simply because uh, they get retinal bleeds as if uh, in the moment where they are uh, returned back into normoxic state, um, uh, they will have uh, hypoxemia within the now avascular retina. New vessel sprouts will form, they are leaky. Uh, this will lead to retinal bleeds and ultimately um, blindness. In order to form stable blood vessels, you'll need angiopoietins uh, that are the partner of VEGF and they act on the so-called TIE receptor. And there are two different types of angiopoietins, angiopoietin 1 and 2. If you engineer, again, mice that do not have angiopoietin 1 or the TIE receptor re responsible for the binding towards the endothelium, you will have a normal primary vasculature, as this one is organized by VEGF. But there's a failure to associate this primary vasculature with the support cells, and this will lead to a missing remodeling and the missing stability of the primary vasculature. It is as if you had only VEGF. On the other hand, if you overexpress angiopoietin 1, you have a hypervascularization of tissue with an increase in vessel size, but not an increase in the number of vessels, as the number of vessels is mediated by VEGF and you have vessels that are resistant to leakage. Angiopoietin 1 can be regarded as a stabilizer, and angiopoietin 2 is a destabilizer. Now you may ask, why do we need a destabilizer in this system? You need the destabilizer 
in order to revert the matured blood vessel into a more plastic form, i.e. something that happens when you grow and the uh, body has now new um, uh, like tissues where uh, blood vessels need to sprout into. So angiopoietin 2 allows the endothelial cell to revert to a more primitive, more earlier or more plastic state that will either lead to regression of the vessel when there's no VGF present or to the formation of new vessels. This prevents, for example, from us to have too many blood vessels in area that we don't need them or too few blood vessels in the areas where new blood vessels are needed. So angiopoietin 2 is necessary for pruning and the initiation of angiogenic sprouting. In summary, angioproteins are important for blood vessel maturation and they induce the remodeling as well as stabilization of the blood vessels through interactions with the extracellular matrix and they maintain the stability of the mature vasculature. So VEGF makes new blood vessels, angiopoietin stabilizes them and now we need a third um, a growth factor that acts on the endothelium that is important for giving the blood vessels their identity, i.e. we have blood vessels that are arterial, we have blood vessels that are venous, we have blood vessels that are capillary in, uh, like, uh, in nature, we have vessels that are lymphatic in nature. Therefore, we will have certain markers on the endothelium which will uh, make the identity of a certain blood vessel to be either an artery or a vein. And uh, the arterial markers are the efferin B2s, the venous markers are the efferin B4s. They regulate uh, the interaction between the smooth muscle cells and uh, the endothelial cells. And it's of importance and interesting to see that these uh, receptors are not only uh, uh, revolving around blood vessels alone, but they are also important for the guidance of axons, i.e. during the chemotaxis, and therefore for the CNS development. And this already explains to you why you have um, now a growing body of evidence that certain vascular malformations are associated with specific disorders of CNS development. You will all know certain developmental venous anomalies that can be associated with focal cortical dysplasias, the focal cortical dysplasias type 4. Or you have, may have read in recent uh, uh, publications the association of polymicrogyria and brain AVMs. And there are other associations that uh, indicate that uh, those growth factors are not just uh, uh, acting on blood vessels, but they are also acting on the development of the central nervous system. So you don't have separated systems, but the systems have to interact and interdigitate with uh, each other. And of course, this is uh, highly simplified because you not only have one vascular endothelial growth factor, but multiple ones, and you have not only one receptor, but multiple ones, and they all need to interact uh, with each other in a coordinated uh, fashion. So we talked about the growth factors. Now let's go deeper into uh, the uh, vascular genesis, i.e. the new formation of blood vessels from where previously there were no blood vessels at all, i.e. from avascular tissues. During vascular genesis, endothelial cells differentiate and proliferate within the primary avascular tissue. They coalesce and form a tubular network with the aorta, the major veins, and the plexus in between, i.e. the primary vasculature. This is driven by uh, VEGF. This happens within the mesoderm, i.e. between the exoderm and the endoderm, where cells migrate from the ectoderm towards the stratum in between ectoderm and mesoderm. And within this mesoderm that will form not only the blood vessels, but also the heart, you will now have, this is ectoderm, this is endoderm, you'll have a segregation and migration of 
vasculogenic progenitor cells that will form primitive vascular cords close to the endoderm because they are inhibited by ectoderm. These vascular cords will then start to form into endothelial cells driven by HIF and therefore VGF, i.e. driven by the oxygen tension within the mesoderm. And these endothelial cells will then further coalesce and form the primary vascular network. Some of those cells that were like, uh, like that formed the vascular cords will form the endothelium. Some of those cells will become uh, like a, a hemangioplast and red blood cells. This happens close to the endoderm because vessel formation is promoted by endoderm and VGF. Vessel formation is inhibited by ectoderm. So if you look at uh, here, the ectoderm and the ectoderm forms, as you know, the neural crest and the neural tube, the uh, primitive endothelial cells, the primitive vascular cords are close to the endoderm and are inhibited by the ectoderm and uh, here the neural tube that will form uh, or, uh, uh, or that will be forming the neural tube. HIF alpha is uh, regulated by oxygen tension and this will uh, activate VGF, which will activate then uh, the um, formation of blood vessels. This is again demonstrated here where close to the endoderm you have the development of uh, the blood vessels uh, uh, with uh, the dorsal aorta uh, pr uh, here. And it's interesting that it's not only VEGF that is of importance for this, but also the notch receptors. And as you all know, the notch receptors uh, are diseased in uh, diseases such as Cadazil, where you have an uh, in uh, like uh, the belated phase, an accumulation of um, junk within the smallest blood vessels, which will lead to microangiopathy. So these growth receptors uh, are actually uh, reused uh, later in life. The bilateral dorsal aorta become distinct from the first vein before the blood circulates, i.e. before angiogenesis. So the identification of vessels into arteries and veins happens after vasculogenesis but before angiogenesis. And arteries are defined by the efferent B2, by notch 3, um, whereas veins are defined by the absence of notch 3 and uh, by efferent uh, B4. The other thing that is of importance to realize, and this is something that um, uh, uh, showcases that the blood vessels that we are speaking about and that we are treating in the brain uh, are different from the blood vessels uh, that our body interventionalist uh, colleague are treating in the body or our cardiologist colleagues are treating within the heart is that within the heart, within the body, both the endothelial cells, the pericytes and the smooth muscle, as well as the connective cells are all derived from the mesoderm. In the head and neck and in the central nervous system, it is actually not the same i.e. whereas the endothelial cells are still derived from the mesoderm all over the place, the pericytes, smooth muscle and connective cells in the head, neck and face and in the central nervous system are actually derived from the neural crest, which means that the blood vessels in the body are substantially different from the blood vessels within the brain. And therefore you may easily now say that let's say a stent that is coated with uh, uh, something that is working for the heart will not necessarily work in the same way or shape or form uh, in the brain, simply because the formation and the phylogenetic history of uh, the blood vessels is a completely different one for the central nervous system as compared for the rest of the body. This was a brief uh, introduction into vasculogenesis. Now we'll have to go into the first embryonic angiogenesis. Angiogenesis means that this primitive network that was formed during vasculogenesis is modified, i.e. you have uh, from this uh, tubular network 
some vessels that are pruned. You don't need those guys here any longer, so they are vanishing. Some vessels, on the other hand, are getting larger, like these guys here, and you have a remodeled vasculature. And this remodeled vasculature will be uh, remodeled due to A, VGF, i.e. you have an abundance of VEGF, you will need more blood vessels. You have no VEGF, i.e. Hy uh, no hypoxemia, you will need no blood vessels here. Then you need the angiopoietin 1 for the formation of the stabilized blood vessels, the angiopoietin 2 for the remodeling, regression, pruning of other blood vessels, the efferents for the identification of what is an artery and what is a vein, and you will develop from the primitive vasculature a remodeled vasculature. And one of the best examples of this remodeling is uh, what is happening to the aortic arches during uh, uh, your embryonic life. As you know, um, we have multiple pharyngeal arches um, that will form from this very like primitive uh, uh, composition our carotid arteries, our internal carotid arteries, our external carotid arteries, our vertebral arteries, uh, depending on uh, like the remodeling of those primitive uh, pharyngeal uh, branch arches. The endothelial cells uh, have multiple roles uh, and play not only a role for the development of blood vessels, i.e. they are not just like bystanders that are sitting there in the blood vessels doing nothing, but they are actively involved in the differentiation and formation of an, the head and neck structures. Remember that the head and neck um, is uh, the blood vessels in the head and neck form an interplay between neural crest and uh, the mesoderm. And in this case here, the mesodermal endothelial cells secrete certain paracrine substances, the so-called endothelines. And these endothelines are important for the formation of the head and neck structures, i.e. they talk to uh, like the ectoderm, uh, to tell them to form specific uh, cells. And therefore, if you don't have endothelines, or on the other hand, if you don't have blood vessels forming correctly within the head and neck structures, you will get craniofacial malformations. And this will explain, for example, why you have certain vascular malformations that go along with disorders of your craniofacial uh, morphometry, such as the FACES syndrome, uh, to which we will uh, speak uh, later upon. So the cells that constitute the face, as you know, are derived from the neural crest. These cells migrate along predetermined pathways. They are guided and accompanied by the endothelial cells. They have to interplay together to form stable blood vessels. And while they are migrating, they seed their daughter cells along a certain predetermined pathway. And so those cells know where they are going. They are migrating from the neural crest outwards and they have predetermined pathways along a metameric distribution. These neural crest cells will form the tunica media of the blood vessels, but also the bones and connective tissues of the face. So here is the neural crest. Here are the neural crest cells. We have down here the mesoderm. The neural crest cell migrate along predetermined pathways, along like certain areas into the prosencephalon, uh, into the rhombencephalon, etc. And while they are migrating, they will inter, uh, like interplay with the endothelial cells coming from the mesoderm and will, re uh, will, um, uh, will migrate into regionalized structures. This will explain why we'll have, for example, the cerebrofacial artivenous metameric syndromes. So to summarize this, um, portion of, best, uh, of angiogenesis in the embryo. In the pharyngeal endoderm, HIF is produced in response to hypoxemia. This will lead to an increase in VEGF. This will lead to the formation of the aortic arch cage around the pharyngeal endoderm. 
This will lead now to the formation of the endothelines that will help uh, to um, differentiate certain head and neck uh, structures and the morphometry of our head and neck uh, areas. And um, this will lead to remodeling not only of the aortic pharyngeal cage, but also the formation of bones. Now uh, we are born, what about the postnatal angiogenesis? In the postnatal angiogenesis, the same things happen uh, uh, as compared to the prenatal angiogenesis. We are growing, certain areas will need new blood vessels, certain areas will no longer need blood vessels. And so from the remodeled vasculature where we have stable mature vessels due to destabilization process, i.e. that is mediated by angiopoietin 2, we have an unstable blood vessel. This unstable blood vessel has now two different fates depending on whether uh, new blood vessels are needed. New blood vessels are needed if you have hypoxemia and therefore increase VEGF, then you will get angiogenic sprouting from this unstable vessel. If on the other hand, uh, the unstable vessel is present in an area that is not hypoxemic, there will be no VEGF and the blood vessel will regress. So in order to form this, you first have to dissolute the outer mural elements, angiopoietin 2. You have to activate the endothelial cells, VEGF. There will be directional sprouting, i.e. the sprouting will go towards the area where you have no uh, not enough uh, oxygen. And then at one point in time, these new sprouts will have to become mature again, i.e. if they have to be recovered with the parasites, thus stabilize the newly formed blood vessel and reconstitute the vessel wall with uh, the secretion of specialized matrices. The same growth factors that were present during embryonic vasculogenesis are reused again during the post and also prenatal angiogenesis, i.e. you will see again that VEGF, TGF beta angioproteins are again of importance during this postnatal angiogenesis. There are a couple of peculiarities regarding the growth of endothelial cells if you compare them, let's say, to the uh, growth cycle of uh, dermal cells or of um, cells that line your gut. Whereas cells that line your gut replenish or divide every like four hours, cells that replenish uh, your dermis replenish every eight hours or divide every eight hours, endothelial cells extremely rarely divide. They uh, divide only once in three to 14 years. On average, it is said that your endothelial cells divide every seven years, which means that by the way, your blood vessels are now completely different blood vessels than they were seven years ago or that you will have in seven years. Meaning that the blood vessels that you have right now are not the same throughout your lifetime, but they need to be replenished, just like dermal cells need to be replenished. Again, on average, every seven years. However, the endothelial cells can be induced to replicate extremely fast, i.e. to once in five days. And this is due to the fact that while you're growing, you may need to form new blood vessels. If you cut yourself and you have a bleed and you need to have new formation of blood vessels, it doesn't make sense that it takes seven years for these blood vessels to form. No, they are induced to be replicated now very fast, i.e. once in five days. And this is different from the endothelial cells to other cells that you have in uh, your body. And of course, this is of importance when uh, something grows inside of you that shouldn't grow there. So if you have a tumor that is growing in a vascular tissue, it will first start to grow just because of diffusion of oxygen into the tumor, i.e. the tumor has enough oxygen to still grow, and this is the avascular tumor growth. However, at one point in time, the tumor becomes so large that uh, its center will become hypoxemic, and therefore, you will have an increase in VEGF, 
therefore you will have the sprouting of new blood vessels into this tumor and these blood vessels may actually be immature and this is what you're seeing if you are performing let's say angiography in a glioblastoma multiforme you will see abnormal blood vessels sprouting into the tumor and nowadays we don't do angiographies any longer for gbms uh, but uh, uh, if you look at the old books and if you ever happen to do an angiography you will see these corkscrew like vessels i.e immature vessels what we do do however in gbm is uh, we do contrast enhanced mr and what you will see in contrast enhanced mr is that there's a leakage of contrast into the tumor and this leakage of contrast into the tumor is related to the fact that the blood vessels that are uh, going into the blood uh, into the tumor are mainly vgf dependent and therefore are leaky and therefore you have leakage of contrast material into the tumor now you can understand for those of you who are doing also diagnostic neuroradiology why certain drugs that you give in, uh, for example, treatment of uh, GBMs lead to um, uh, like less contrast enhancement. You give Avestin as your first line of treatment. Now, what is Avestin? Avestin is an inhibitor of VG VEGF. And if you give an inhibitor of VEGF into a glioblastoma multiforme, there will be no longer contrast enhancement because VEGF is downregulated. Therefore, um, you don't have any longer leaky cells. And this explains why certain patients under Avestin can, for, uh, can uh, present with a, a, a pseudo-regression, i.e. the tumor can still grow, although you don't see contrast enhancement. And you don't see the contrast enhancement simply because VEGF is downregulated, but the tumor has found other ways and forms to get its oxygen and therefore continues uh, to grow. So again, understanding the interplay of hypoxemia, VGF, VGF, uh, and the tumor as well as the inhibitors of VGF can explain to you how you see now different tumors and how you can explain regression, pseudo-regression, or even pseudo-progression. We talked about vasculogenesis, angiogenesis, embryonic and postnatal. Now we'll have to introduce the so-called angiogenic switch. The angiogenic switch means that you have uh, certain periods in time and certain factors that will lead to a pro-angiogenic, i.e. sprouting type of angiogenesis. And you will have certain factors that will lead to cessation of this sprouting. And the difference between the so-called activation phase of the angiogenesis to the so-called resolution phase of the angiogenesis is called the angiogenic switch. Again, the activation phase is where you have an increased permeability of the endothelium, new sprouts form that go into hypoxemic tissue, and you have a new formation of a lumen. This activation phase has to be counterbalanced with the resolution phase where there's a stop of the endothelial cell proliferation. Your basement membrane is reconstructed and the endothelial junctions are reformed. And this switch between activation and resolution phase is mediated by a couple of uh, hormones, uh, 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 genetic substances, and these are uh, called uh, the endocrine and the ALK1. So they mediate the angiogenic switch, meaning that if endoglin or ALK1 are missing, you will have an imbalance of activation versus resolution. You have an too much activation versus too little resolution, which will lead to structural abnormalities of vessels such as abnormal shunts. And this is present, for example, in hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia or Morbus rendo weber osler And uh, in HHT1, there's a defect that will lead to less endoglin to be uh, uh, developed. In HHT2, there's a, uh, a problem of your ALK1. 
and therefore um, you will have uh, a problem of your vascular remodeling and this can manifest itself in shunts or till injectasias and we'll talk about this later when we talk about the applications. In fact, uh, when we are now uh, uh, moving ahead here, uh, let's talk about the applications of what we have uh, learned in this first portion of uh, the talk. We'll talk about four different uh, aspects. We'll talk about a classification of brain vascular malformation that is based on these concepts uh, that we just uh, talked about. We'll talk about um, this issue of are AVMs are congenital, are brain vascular malformations congenital? We talk about the angiographic appearance of specific diseases, the arteriovenous metameric syndromes or Weibel Mason syndrome, HHT AVMs. And we'll talk about why certain complications can occur, for example, if we ligate vascular malformations uh, uh, during our treatment. We have all learned during our residency or during medical school the Russell and Rubinstein neurovascular uh, uh, classification that is based on morphology. And in this Russell and Rubinstein classification, we knew that there are four different types of vascular malformations, the AVMs, the cavernomas, the tail injectagias, and the DVAs. And this is um, good for your everyday life, but it's a rather oversimplified classification. The classification that Pierre Lajunias uh, uh, proposed uh, is a more uh, thorough classification that will help you to understand vascular diseases, uh, in our opinion, somewhat better. And this is an etiological classification that is based on three different um, pillars. The first pillar uh, that we will be talking about is the target, i.e. which portion of the vascular tree is impacted. Do we have an arterial disease? Do we have a venous disease? Or is it a disease based on the lymphatics? And here it is of importance to again understand that arteries, veins, and lymphatic vessels are molecularly distinct. They are not just simple pipes, but following angiogenesis and prior to, sorry, following vascular genesis and prior to angiogenesis, blood vessels are molecularly defined targets. An embryonic vein, for example, that is notch negative and efferin uh, B2 positive, will, uh, depending on other uh, receptors, separate itself into lymphatic vessel or a venous blood vessels. And therefore, your arteries, veins, and lymphatic tubes are not just simple pipes, but they are molecularly defined targets. And you may have therefore diseases that only hit the arteries, arterial aneurysms, dissections, the pure arterial malformations, faces. You will have diseases that purely hit the veins, venolymphatic malformations, maxillofacial uh, uh, venal lymphatic malformations. You will have diseases that are more on the venous side, developmental venous anomalies, cavernomas. You will have diseases that are present within the capillary bed, i.e. your arteriovenous malformation, where your problem is somewhere between the arteries and the veins. And this will explain why you have certain diseases on certain uh, aspects of your arterial veno lymphatic tree. The second pillar that uh, uh, Lajunias discussed was the timing, i.e., do you have a hit that uh, hits your blood vessel very early on, i.e., already during the vasculogenesis, or is it a hit that hits the blood vessel very late in life? Remember that the blood vessels from the neural crest or from the uh, brain, head and neck form from neural crest blood vessels that segregate and migrate from segmented regions. And while they are migrating, they seed their daughter cells along the pathway. 
if you now have a defect in the migrating cell very early on, it will be transmitted to the daughter cells along its migrating pathway. So let's say we have a cell here that is happily living in the neural crest. Now a certain early hit uh, hits the, this cell and makes it a diseased cell, i.e. a cell that is prone to form, uh, for example, shunts. This diseased cell will divide and migrate. And while it migrates, it will seed its daughter cell along a certain pathway, i.e. all of those cells that have now migrated will have the same like, disease pattern in themselves, i.e. the propensity to form arteriovenous malformation. And this can be now compared to a cell that very late in the migration pathway did get the hit, i.e. a more late hit will therefore be more focal as compared to an early hit that will have a larger impact on a larger amount of vascular malformations. And this will now allow you to kind of cross-tabulate your arterial diseases, your venous diseases, your arteriovenous or capillary diseases into late hits, i.e. that are more focal, and early hits, i.e. hits that will be metameric in origin. And we will populate this grid later on. First, we'll have to discuss the third uh, aspect of um, your, uh, or the third pillar of the etiological classification of Lajumias, and this is whether you have a purely genetical trigger, versus a purely environmental trigger. So purely genetical triggers are the monogenetical diseases, i.e. HHT, blue rubber blood nevus, certain cavernomas that are related to crit gene mod modification. And these can be uh, counterbalanced to the purely extrinsic diseases, i.e. there you have mainly a role of the environment. And then you can see that you have certain diseases that are more on the genetic side and certain diseases that are more on the environmental side. And this will help you to add a third dimension into your uh, grid that will look at the focal non-genetic arterial diseases, i.e. your arterial aneurysm, your dissection, versus the focal genetically determined arterial diseases i.e. aneurysms or dissections associated with Ehlers Danlos, polycystic kidney disease. You will have arterial diseases that can be segmental, such as neuroaneurysms. You can have arterial diseases that are metameric phases syndrome, where you have a very early hit that will therefore lead to a, like a widespread disease. Arteriovenous diseases can be focal, non-genetic or focal genetic. And we have now learned that certain AVMs have actually somatic mutations. So actually move from the purely environmental to a more like genetically determined uh, pathway. You can have the metameric arteriovenous diseases, the cerebrofacial arteriovenous metameric syndromes. We will talk about those later. Venous diseases can be focal cavernomas, developmental venous anomalies, can be focal and genetically determined crit gene um, and malformations that will lead to familiar cavernomas, dural sinus malformations, and cerebrofacial venous metameric syndromes on the early metameric level versus blue rubber blood nevus on the genetically determined venous metameric lesions are uh, other examples that will allow you to put the, your vascular malformation that you will encounter into this type of etiologically determined grid that is determined by obviously what you've learned regarding to angiogenesis and vasculogenesis. Next portion that I would like to talk about are uh, the congenital nature of brain vascular malformations. Uh, when uh, you speak to your patient, you often may say that, oh, you have an AVM. This is a pre presumably a disease that you have lived with all of your life. But is this true? Do you really have your AVM 
since birth? Are you born with an AVM? There's a growing evidence that uh, uh, there are certain AVMs that develop only later in life. And there are multiple publications now that have demonstrated with widespread imaging for headaches, etc., that some individuals didn't have an AVM and then later on developed an AVM. This contradicts, obviously, this congenital nature of brain vascular malformation. Or does it? Well, what do these three patients have in common? This patient has an aneurysm that presented with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. This patient has an AVM that presented with a bleed. This patient has a stroke that presented uh, or has a carotid uh, uh, disease that presented with a stroke. All of these patients have a vascular disease that is present at the clinical stage. However, prior to the clinical stage, we have a morphological stage where the aneurysm is incidentally found, i.e. has not yet bled, where the AVM is incidentally found, i.e. did not present with epilepsy or did not present with a hemorrhage yet, or where the carotid stenosis has been incidentally found, i.e. a lesion is visible, however not yet symptomatic. What we have to understand is this prior to the clinical stage and prior to the morphological stage, there are various other stages of vascular diseases. And in order to make you understand this slide here, we will go one step back and say that we have a cell here. And the cell has some a chromosome and some genes, and it's happily living there and it's completely normal, i.e. we are in the pre-pathological stage. Due to a primary trigger, the so-called causative trigger, we have now moving into a genetical stage where the body is not yet diseased. However, one single cell has a single mutation. If this cell does not die, but now actually continues to multiply, we move towards a biological stage where we have an organ with a weakness, a blood vessel that has the propensity to develop an AVM. And this biological stage is pre-morphological, i.e. the AVM is not there, but the organ, your blood vessel, has the propensity to develop a weakness. And due to a secondary or revealing trigger, you are in the now morphological stage where your brain has an AVM, but it has not yet bled. And this will then lead to the clinical or symptomatic stage. Let's give you one example for this two-trigger hypothesis. We have a mutation in the endoglean gene. This mutation in the endoglean gene will lead to the disease HHT with a propensity to develop AVMs, i.e. the baby is born with the disease HHT, but the baby is not born necessarily with nosebleeds. The baby is not born with the mucocutaneous telangiectasias that are typical for Morbus rendo weber osler for HHT, but it's born with a propensity to develop those. And while the blood vessels mature, while the blood vessels redevelop, while the blood vessels go through the destabilization stabilization process, at one point in time, an asymptomatic AVM may develop, and this can then, at one point in time, rupture, or the AVM can present with epilepsy. And therefore, AVMs are not really congenital in the way that they are present at birth, but you may be living with the propensity to develop an AVM. And now think about a completely different disease. Think about neurofibromatosis. You're not born with a vestibular schwannoma, but you're born with a propensity to develop a vestibular schwannoma. Not every patient with neurofibromatosis has a vestibular schwannoma, but he has the propensity to develop a vestibular schwannoma. So you're not born with the AVM, but you're born with a dormant, but transmittable defect in a certain vascular segment. And 
in case you have this vascular remodeling, there's the possibility of unmasking the defect within your vasculature, i.e. an AVM may develop. So this is the second portion of the talk that um, uh, helps you to understand the congenital nature of brain vascular malformations. The third aspect that I would like to discuss about are now certain diseases. The first one is Van Hippel-Lindau disease. In Van Hippel-Lindau disease, your genetical problem is that the VHL suppressor protein is lost. Due to this, its products that are normally suppressed are accumulating and it happens to be that the VHL suppressor protein suppresses hypoxia inducible factor. Now knowing what HIF does, you will now be able to uh, look at the next cascade steps. If HIF is overrepresented, you will have an overrepresentation of VEGF. If you have an overrepresentation of VEGF, it will mean that you have accelerated growth and a high vascularization of leaky, immature blood vessels. And these leaky, immature blood vessels will form highly vascularized tumor that of course demonstrate contrast enhancement on um, your um, uh, contrast enhanced MR. Next disease are the cerebrofacial arteriovenous metameric syndromes or Weiber Mason syndrome or in the French literature Bonnet de Chamblon disease. Remember that when a defect in the migrating cells is present early on, this defect will be transmitted to the daughter cells along its migrating pathway. And if this defect happens to be a defect that is causing uh, arteriovenous shunting disease, you will have the propensity of develop arteriovenous malformations in a metameric syndrome, i.e. you can have the midline prosencephalic or olfactory type where you have involvement of the midline structures, this patient here, a corpus callosum AVM, together with an AVM of the nose, the midline prosencephalic metameric syndrome, or in this patient here, the lateral prosencephalic type, where you have involvement of thalamus and AVMs that are involving the maxilla or the orbit, or in this example here, a rhombencephalic type, where you have arteriovenous malformation involving the posterior fossa, but also the mandible. And finally, um, and this explains to you why if you have a patient with, um, let's say, brain AVM, you should always inject your external carotid arteries to look for these metameric syndromes. Or if you have a patient that you treat for a mandibular AVM, you have to inject the vertebral arteries as well to see whether there is an additional vascular malformation elsewhere. These vascular malformations can be uh, metachronous, i.e. not synchronous, not happen at the same time, but they may develop later in life, which means that if you follow a patient with, uh, let's say, an orbital AVM, you have to see whether at one point in time the patient may develop a thalamic AVM. Or if you have a patient with a posterior fossa AVM, you should develop or follow the patient and actually look for mandibular AVM to develop later on in life. The third disease that we will be talking about is HHT. Remember in HHT, you have a mutation in endoglin or ALK1, which will lead to a problem in your angiogenic switch. This is work uh, done uh, by UCSF. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Walker looked at what are the requisi requisites for brain AVM to form. If you have no ALK1 and there's the presence of VGF, then AVMs form 
in the mice brain. If you have no ALK1, but don't develop VEGF or don't have an overexpression of VEGF, no AVMs form. If you have an ALK1 wild type, i.e. normal angiogenic switch and the presence of VEGF, no AVMs form. And therefore, in order for an AVM to form, not only do you need a problem in the angiogenic switch, you also have to activate your brain vasculature. You have to activate it through VEGF, and if then there is no resolution phase, i.e. if the switch is not switched, then uh, you have abnormal shunts. And these abnormal shunts can be visualized here in an endoglean knockout mouse that we have uh, in Toronto, um, where you can see uh, on uh, 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 a, a rest, uh, uh, electron microscopy the abnormal arterial venous direct shunts and the nidus type artery venous malformations. And this resembles the direct arteriovenous fistulas that you can see in adults, or in this case here in the pediatric case of HHT, or the arteriovenous glomus type or nidus type arteriovenous malformations, as we can see here in a micro injection uh, of uh, an HHT patient that has this striking resemblance with this nidus type uh, AVMs that we see in the end of the knockout mouse. And again, work from Dr. Su from the UCSF group um, that looked at the potential of now using Avestin as a VEGF inhibitor to inhibit brain vascular malformation. And indeed, in, pay, uh, in mice that were ALK negative and where you gave VEGF, AVMs formed. However, if you injected Avestin in the same type of mice, then no brain arteriovenous malformations formed. The final area where I believe that um, the understanding of angiogenesis, vasculogenesis, and um, brain AVMs uh, uh, helps to understand you uh, to, to, to see how AVMs form is if we look at the effect that the brain AVM has on the adjacent brain. We all see this brain AVM here, but often surrounding the brain AVM, we see vessels that do not shunt. They are not interconnected to any vein here, but they are definitely not normal vessels. These are normal vessels. These are abnormal vessels. So surrounding an AVM, we may see angiogenesis and this angiogenesis is seen perinidally and why do we have angiogenesis around a nidus think about what the nidus does the nidus is sucking blood into the nidus therefore in the distality of your normal brain there will not be enough oxygenated blood this means that in the vicinity of a brain AVM, you will have hypoxemia. Therefore, VEGF will increase. Therefore, you have abnormal sprouting of perinidal blood vessels. How, and, and, and this is one example. If you look at this fistulous AVM, you see two dilated blood vessels. However, only this blood vessel feeds directly into the vein. How can I say so? Well, look at the 3D. This blood vessel directly goes into the vein right here with a fistulous connection being from the artery to the vein right here. And this is now the further draining vein. Direct arteriovenous fistula. This blood vessel here gets smaller, smaller, larger, larger, and interconnects here with the fistula-bearing blood vessel. So what are we seeing here? 
These are your hypertrophied leptomeningeal anastomoses that are indirectly activated due to the hypoxemia in the brain tissue right here because all the blood is being shunted away from the brain into the fistula, which means that this fistula is only being fed by a single artery. This artery here will feed normal brain parenchyma first before it's interconnected through artery to artery leptomeningeal collaterals. Another example here, fistulous AVM. Does the ACA feed the AVM? No, the ACA gets smaller, 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 and then larger, 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 until it coalesces into a distal MCA branch that is now retrogradally sucking the blood into the fistula. Which means that what you are seeing here are not AVM vessels. These are your leptomeningeal collaterals that are induced due to the fistulous nature of the AVM. The fistulous nature of the AVM has led, led to local hypoxemia. The local hypoxemia has led to a VEGF increase. The VEGF increase has led to a perinidal angiogenesis, which has led to your collaterals to be present. By the way, the same collaterals that will be present if you have a downstream, let's say, MCA stenosis. MCA stenosis here, less blood coming up here, hypoxemia in the watershed zone, and your leptomeningeal collaterals taking over your blood supply. Completely different diseases, ICAT versus fistulous AVM, but due to the knowledge of hypoxemia inducible factor, VEGF, angiogenesis, same type of pattern, i.e. hypertrophy of your leptomeningeal collaterals. Final aspect here, understanding complications. We believe that um, by understanding your uh, the AVM, by understanding what uh, happens surrounding an AVM, you will understand why you have certain complications if you treat, uh, for example, an AVM the wrong way. Here's an example where we have an ICA fed small AVM. Uh, in the old days, uh, we were not able to get with the microcatheter any further, so we decided to inject, uh, at this point in time, we only had blue, we uh, decided to inject glue there. The glue stopped dead, never reached uh, the AVM nidus. So we only had a ligation embolization, which meant that on our first control run, we didn't see the AVM. But the AVM proper is still there. Now that we have ligated the blood vessel, what will happen? You ligate the blood vessel, which means that the brain parenchyma is hypoxemic. This will lead to VEGF increase. This will lead to new vessels sprouting. And since the AVM is still there, new blood vessels, this time from the SCA, will reconstitute your AVM. And this, of course, is the same when you treat dural AV fistulas and you only ligate the artery and you don't get from the distal artery into the proximal vein, i.e. you have to treat the segment that is diseased, the arteriovenous segment. And so understanding angiogenesis will help you to understand this complication. Understanding angiogenesis will help you to understand why for certain facial vascular malformation, like treating them with only a ligation embolization or doing anything that will increase VEGF will lead to formation of new blood vessels and will lead to an aggravation of these symptoms. This patient here was treated with a ligation embolization only, and you see that many years later, the AVM is now waverse. Same here, this patient uh, with a vascular malformation of the mandible was treated uh, by ligation embolization, and you see that the network here of abnormal vessels has just 
reconstituted the blood vessels. So to conclude, um, uh, and I'm sorry for the long talk and congratulations for those of you who have uh, bared with me so far. Uh, understanding the concepts of vascular genesis and angiogenesis uh, helps you to understand uh, vascular malformations better, i.e. diseased vessels are not just pipes that need some plumbing, but that are complex biological systems that need treatments focused on the cause of the disease rather than the symptoms. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, a great talk and uh, a very comprehensive review from many perspectives, right? Um, it's not, uh, I mean, in, in so many ways that fascinating for many of us. A lot of us are obviously, as you showed, like at the very end of the spectrum in this, like a, in a clinical setting, we're just at the end of spectrum reading, the rupture, whatever. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not simplifying too much, but obviously, like our our specialty. I mean, personally, I believe that our specialty, the way it's evolved, uh, it's a multidisciplinary epigenetic system. Like training is generally a couple of years, maybe maybe even less. Not really enriched in a lot of the basic science and a lot of the approach that you have shown, um, and so that. Creates, um, I think that creates a lot of heterogeneity, and people know a lot of us don't know any of this stuff. I think it's, it's obvious to acknowledge that people don't get exposed to it, they don't appreciate the importance of it, and how that connects. Many of us don't treat them as individuals, um, some aspects of the more common things. So a lot of that is, I think, is the need for a field. Going forward, I hope that there's more exposure to this. Uh, can you comment on some of these factors? Could you comment on maybe what you see as the future of vascular education or our specialty? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I think uh, one one uh, important aspect uh, to to discuss is um, indeed um, the we have understood, for example, that many so-called sporadic AVMs are related to um, a, a somatic mutation within the KRAS pathway, which is interestingly enough also a tumor pathway. And it indicates to us that uh, in all likelihood, uh, 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 these brain AVMs are way more like genetically determined as we like to believe and have more in common with um, with tumors as compared to, uh, to, 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 to true vascular malformations, which can explain the interplay that we sometimes see in certain uh, vascular malformations in relation to um, uh, like, like a true proliferative aspect. Um, I, I think it is important, just as you mentioned, that we are not only looking at uh, like treatment, or oh, this is an AVM, we need to embolize it, or oh, this is an AVM, we need to do a stereotactic radiation, but try to understand more of it. And I think that in 10, 15, 20 years, we will kind of um, uh, be baffled by uh, ourselves having treated AVMs the way that we are treating them uh, today. In order to actually drive home some points, if you allow me, Maxime, I have uh, like, like two or three cases that I would like to show you uh, where I would like to um, discuss with the audience some of the aspects that I believe are really important when we are talking about these concepts. Is this okay with you? Yes, of course. No, that's exactly that. Thank you. That's exactly what we need. Okay, so my question to you, and uh, 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 I don't know, you can use the chat function or you don't have to. Uh, how big is this AVM? Like sometimes we want to, um, uh, like when we perform radio surgery, you are asked to delineate the AVM or when you perform your embolization with onyx or with glue or whatever you are using, you need to know what you need to treat. And therefore, a simple question, uh, multiple choice. Is this AVM this big or this big or this big? 
one, two, three. Okay, so we have a way to address that actually. We have, let me see if I remember. We can use the poll. There's a poll. Yeah, we can use the poll. Let's do the poll. Dr. Right. Dr. Prince, can, can you go back though so we don't see the overlay? Sure. Um, okay, here we go. Oh, number one, this would be yellow. This is option number three, actually. Yellow is three. Orange is two or B and red is one or A. Okay, so red is A, correct? Orange is B and yellow is C, correct, Tima? I just want to make sure. We correct. So A would be the huge one, uh -huh. B, uh, uh, B would be the middle one, Um, okay. I've launched the poll. You can't see the results yet because. Can you see the results? Yes, I can see them, but if I show them to everyone, people might start changing their answers depending on. What ah, okay. That, that so you can't see them on my screen because I see them too. Oh, you okay? Maybe your co-host. That's why you can see them. Ah, okay. So so far, forty-seven out of uh, eighty-two people have voted. Okay, I think we are we are nearly ready. I think so. So let me end it, and then I can. Here are the results. So now I think everybody should be able to see what the results are, correct? Okay, so the majority thought B. And I think this is completely reasonable. I will try now to tell you that it's actually A. So this is during the first embolization session. We went into a fistulous component here. We treated the fistulous component, and this is at the end of the first session. So we are here January 19th, and uh, remember, this is how it looked like before. We treated the fistula here, artery, vein, got, uh, in this case here, the glue into the venous structure. And then what I would like you to look for is now this area here. What happens with it over time? So. Keep this in your mind. And now we go to April 14th, second session. And you see this area here now? Nothing was done in between, no radio surgery, just one session of embolization, only the fistula was taken. This is how it looked like immediately after the embolization. This one month later and this is the same projection so the area here that you don't see to be connected to a vein just vanished now we go ahead so again this is before embolization after embolization immediately after and on follow-up so this entire area and even this schmutz here goes away. And the AVM is now way more compact. So now we go again in and we take the nidus portion. And this is following the second session of embolization. And this is three months later on follow up and the AVM is gone. So this is the true nidus, a fistula here and the nidus component here. Now, why do I demonstrate this? I believe that many of these vessels here are only perinidal angiogenic vessels. And if you take the fistula away, then these vessels regress with time. And therefore, um, you may have with radio surgery or even with onyx, overtreated your AVM as some of these perinidal vessels can go away. And it just indicates to you that understanding the true size of the AVM 
uh, is, is of importance when you want to treat. And the same thing here, how many feeder does this vessel have? If you, I showed you this, so we will not uh, do the poll here. If you just look at this with um, like uh, very, uh, uh, not, not very thoroughly, you may say, okay, there's one vessel here, one vessel here, and all of this is nidus. And yes, you can get from this vessel with onyx all the way in there, but by doing so, you would kill the hypoxemic brain right here that is asking for help through this vessel to vessel network. Here you can see one blood vessel, the other blood vessel, and the vessel to vessel network in between. So therefore the teaching point here is that surrounding AVM, especially surrounding fistulous AVM, you will have angiogenesis due to local hypoxemia. These vessels regress after treatment and they should not be included in the treatment plan. My second question, and this is again a multiple choice question, and please uh, do a poll. And it's a very, again, simple question. Can you treat a pile brain AVM through a dural feeder? Uh, Maxime, can you start the poll? So, can you treat a pile brain AVM through a dural feeder? So A would be yes, correct? A would be yes. So A is yes, B is no, three, I guess, you know, either yes or no. Yeah. Yes, maybe. And remember your medical school training, no? Mm -hmm. Whenever there was all of the above, it was always right. Let's see if that changes the poll distribution. <laughs> we have had 39 people have voted out of 83 that are, I guess, can vote. There's a couple of people probably, depending on their connection, the type of how they're logging in that you can to access the poll. Um, okay. Okay, so. Should we end? Yep. Yeah. And here. Yeah. Okay, so mainly split between yes and yes, no. Uh, and uh, I will now show you why uh, yes and no uh, is what at least I believe is the correct answer. It's uh, with everything in life, it depends. So have a look at this brain AVM. Here you see clearly transdural induced supply to the posterior portion of like this AVM. But is this really the AVM? Is this really AVM? Look at the blood vessel. We have a fistulous component here. We have your classical high flow angiopathy with massively dilated vessels here. But here, the blood vessels are, yes, they are not normal, but they are not too dilated. The vein derives mainly out of this component here. And if you look very carefully, there's no vein coming from here. This blood vessel here is retrogradely being sucked into the fistula that is present here. This is normal brain. This actually is brain that is crying for oxygen, that is asking for oxygen. And remember, hypoxemia due to a fistulous AVM will lead to perinidal angiogenesis. And this perinidal angiogenesis is distant from the vessel that is uh, like forming the AVM. So if you were to inject your liquid embolic from here, at one point in time, it will go to the AVM. But prior to doing so, it will go through normal brain tissue, i.e. the cortex that has asked for help will uh, uh, be killed. So here, for the same reason as we said previously, uh, you should not treat the hypoxemic brain tissue. Uh, you should not use this as a dural feeder. Here is a different song. If you have here a brain AVM, there's the feeding artery. You see the hook here coming into a nidus here. There's the draining vein here. Feeding artery, hook, nidus, draining vein. 
patient had presented with a bleed at an outside institution. Outside MR showed this, and we thought that this could be a pretty good case uh, for uh, embolization. So patient came to us. Uh, this was the uh, NGO at the outside institution. This was the NGO that we saw. And we went into the same vessel. In fact, uh, if you look at this blood vessel here, we have here the same hook. See the hook here? Same as here. But there's no AVM any longer. There's no AVM here. So we injected the vertebral artery, didn't see anything, and we injected the external carotid artery. And here we see the same draining vein, this time being filled by a meningeal or dural vessel. So the AVM here was taken over by a meningeal blood vessel. And of course, this AVM can be treated with embolization. So superficial sulcal type brain AVMs, i.e. that are very superficially located, can have additional supply from the dura and can be treated through these channels. In fact, we looked at our uh, series um, uh, here uh, over the past, uh, I think, eight years, we had out of 260 AVMs where we had both external and internal injection, we had 29 who had a dural induced supply. If it's a sulcal type AVM, a superficial one, then you can have this direct supply going in. However, if you have a gyral type or deep AVM, and these are pictures from Anton Varavanes, sulcal type AVM versus gyral type AVM, a gyral type AVM, if this one has induced blood supply, it is always going through normal cortex and should therefore not be used for treatment as it is a result of uh, sprouting angiogenesis. Um, whereas in the superficial one, yes, it can be used. So it depends on where your AVM is located. Okay. These uh, were the two cases uh, that I uh, wanted to show. Dima, thank you. Um, thank you, they're awesome cases. Um, and um, I think, so let's, let's turn. So there's some question in the group chat. Um, I think Luca had commented. Um, there's some other, perhaps there are other questions or comments. <clears throat> One, um, one comment um, that I have is, uh, I mean, thanks for showing this uh, AVM with the, like showing us how the size of the NIDO sometimes uh, uh, seems much bigger than what it is. And you show indeed that um, uh, it was the case for an AVM with uh, a fistulous component. And that's usually the case. Whenever there's a, a fistulous component in the AVM, that's really like, uh, creates such a, 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 a fast like a, a, a shunt that creates all sorts of like vascular changes surrounding it that may mimic those changes to be AVM. So, um, so I, I noticed that's usually when there's this discrepancy between what really the nidus is and, uh, and, uh, uh, and what it seems, it's when there's fistulous component in it. I agree, it's mainly present in fistulous component. And this is also like one of the comments that was uh, presented here by Luca, uh, which I uh, b uh, believe is completely true. Those leptomeningeal collaterals, they are always there. They are always there, but they can still be induced. And this is what we are seeing in patients uh, who have um, like either long standing stenosis or not. And if they have a stroke patient with a long-standing stenosis, their collaterals are often better, which means that it's not only, it cannot be only a Venturi effect because then everyone should have the same collaterals. It is also that, in my opinion, at least, that if you have uh, um, like a long-standing stenosis, there is like more dilatation of the vessels. If you have a long-standing fistulous AVM, there will be more angiogenesis. 
but this is not necessarily the true in all patients let's say with um, like nidus type or slow flow vascular malformations in fact in the slow flow vascular malformations you don't see necessarily so much angiogenesis and then we have those diseases like cerebral proliferative angiopathy if um, you look at those there's a slow flow vascular malformation but still you have massive perinatal angiogenesis and what we believe now is in these cases you have an overreactivity to VEGF i.e. Um, it's your VEGF on steroids it's your VEGF uh, which is massively over induced and therefore despite having maybe only a small fistula you will have new vessels forming in uh, forming in there therefore sumping blood away from other brain tissues that therefore are induced to form new blood vessels surrounding it and therefore there's like a proliferative aspect and if you look at VEGF levels in normal AVMs versus proliferative angiopathy you will see that in patients with proliferative angiopathy the VEGF levels are significantly higher I'm sorry if I, I wasn't polite uh, writing my, my opinion on the chat, but I don't want to, to stop your wonderful uh, presentation, wonderful talk. But I think that dead vessels are really there anywhere, everywhere, always. And you can see all when, you, for example, you have a stable and chronic occlusion of the MCA or of the ICA, and you can see the anastomosis on the surface probably if there is no stops and no chronic occlusion that vessels are so tiny that you cannot see but if you have the occlusion or you if you have a need of flow uh, um, the, the, that vessel became bigger and bigger but not for the hypoxia of because there is a, a BGF or other hormone or uh, some substances strange it's a natural effort that you see any, any, any time in your life. Um, for example, in, in driving with a car, if you, any one of us da, uh, driving the same road, the, 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 the road became more and more larger. They need to be more and more larger because they need to, to, to transport, to, to, to accept more and more vehicles. It's the same. There is, I don't think there is a need to... to um, add some other uh, points, other substances, strange genetic um, orders to, to explain this. It's just a, ne a necessity, a need to, to have blood. And the, the, the vessel became bigger. As you, uh, if you have a, an, an ICA occlusion, the other ICA become bigger. As a one, A1 become bigger, and uh, A can become bigger, and you can have aneurysm. It's the same. Time. This is sporadic event, not predetermined. But in my in my mind, it's just my opinion. But uh, yes. But it will take time, right? Sorry. It will take time. Yes. Yes. It's not. It's not immediate. But no. It's no. No. It's not. But it takes time. Yes. Yes. For sure, it takes time. So it may be physical. It may be biological. It may be a combination of both. It may just be the Venturi effect. It may be that the Venturi effect actually does increase uh, the vascular remodeling, no? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And it, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but this is no. my thought. I, I don't want to be uh, impolite or... No, 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 not at all. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, yep. Okay. Oh. Um, there was, I think there was another question. Um, from Amit, um, if you see Dr. Cranes, would you call it so like, so this, like That gets into an interesting clarification, I think, that needs to be made. Is this a dural AVF or sulcal AVM? Can you see, Timo, the, the question? So if we hadn't had the first angiography, we would for, cool, uh, for, for sure call this uh, uh, like a Borden II uh, dural arteriovenous fistula with direct uh, cortical venous reflux. But since we had the previous angiography, 
um, and clearly saw um, Nidus there, um, it would be more likely that this was primarily brain AVM, uh, but that because of the, maybe the clot having occluded the artery has led to some like additional uh, supply coming from uh, the uh, middle meningeal artery. And so here a brain AVM had transformed itself into uh, like a dural AV fistula. And maybe some of the dural AV fistulas uh, that we are seeing were previously brain AVMs. We had just not imaged them like this. But uh, it's, it's extremely rare, uh, this type. It's the only case that I have in, in, in my collection. They, a true AVM goes into a, what looks like a true dural AV fistula. In any case, I think this, this highlights that all of these classification schemes of AVMs, dural AV fistula, they are highly um, artificial and they are only looking at one single point in time and not at the evolution over time. Um, the bottom line is we have here cortical venous reflux in a bled vascular malformation and therefore we don't need to treat it. So I think here we can definitely dumb things down into whatever it is uh, needs treatment. Yeah, but I think that just to follow up on that, um, within the larger spectrum, I think there is, con like often there is confusion about these AVMs that what we think are AVMs that have dural supply. Like, are they some kind of like a hybrid dural brain malformation or what are they? It seems like in most cases it is, as you had shown, the direct, the, the location. So the question is like, where is the seat of disease, right? If we're gonna say that the shunt is the seat of disease, is the seat of disease, if the seat of disease is in the dura, then I think like we would agree it's appropriate to call it a dural whatever, you were gonna call it dural fistula, right? Um, if the seat of disease is in the brain, we're gonna say it's in the brain, and if it happens to be that the primary supplier is somehow occluded and the remaining supplier happens to be from the dura, it has a morphologic appearance of a dural fistula. However, is the seat of disease still in the brain? That's yeah. a question. Um, and just to follow up, like just another comment, like I think that obviously it's wonderful that like as, as you show, one of the power of powers of theory is that it allows you to explain events, like maybe unconnected events that now your theory can bring together, right? Like in, in physics, many theories are like that. So like you have a theory that, that says, okay, like there's a connection between an ICA occlusion and an AVM, and there's, there are factors that are responsible for the evolution of both, right? Similarly, when we go to treatment, we know that the more we understand the disease, the more specific our treatments usually become, right? Or that's the goal. Like when we have, uh, when we talk about dural fistulas, the more we understand the dural fistula, the more we understand that oftentimes you just have to have a magic bullet approach. There's just one little spot that you have to get in a lot of these things. And everything else is just noise, right? Like all of this, like unnecessary arterial embolization. It's just, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. That's where, that's not where the disease is. The same thing that you showed with one of those wonderful cases, right? You just hit the right spot. And how do you, the problem is identifying that spot, right? Like how do you, how do you find it? Like when you show your MCA versus ACA injections, well, okay, like this is a, a scale on which we can understand it because you can see it's coming from different vessels. We, Hope we know the anatomy of that, but it's a fractal, right? Like when you go into the MCA in a fractal fashion, like you start dissecting it more and more. Like at what point, how do we develop the tools that really like allow us to understand exactly what we need to hit? That, I think that's where the, like from a treatment perspective, like from a, a technical treatment, we're gonna treat these with glue or some agent as opposed to like some medication or an infusion. like. We really have to understand where to put our stuff. And um, yeah, so Lucas and Amit's questions, like I think we're all getting around the same ideas, like where do we really hit it? Um, thank you again very much. Is there any other questions or comments? Hey, just a short comment from, from me, uh, Kitong here. 
right? Hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Timo, again for the uh, lecture. Um, I think sometimes this kind of lecture can make people, you know, uh, get confused, uh, which is not uh, the purpose of this lecture at all. So I just want to say that uh, Timo was probably uh, wanted to to show people how to look at this, you know, the the the, the vessels uh, in different aspect. You just don't look at them like big or small, like uh, torches or whatever. It uh, he's trying to tell everyone how how to look at it, how how they uh, derives. Uh, and all the stuff. So now, now the next time you look at your AVM, wh whether or not it's the real, uh, you know, sprouting angiogenesis surrounding it or just collateral uh, supply to it, uh, you, you will look at your AVMs differently. Probably that's the greatest point that uh, you, you should take home and, and look at your diseases differently. Yipong, yeah. thank you. Um, okay, one last go. Any other questions, comments? Uh, and you must talk and follow up cases. All right, Timo, again, thank you so, so much. Um, uh, if um, there are no other comments or questions, we move on. Um, you can share the screen. Luca has a case to show. Um, and um, okay, okay, you can. I'm you. ready if you want. Yes, please go ahead. Um, okay, it's a a very simple case, but um, maybe could uh, have some point of interest. Uh, this is the our team. I want to show you uh, just to because I'm not alone but always with the team, we work together. This is the story of a 40, uh, last month, this guy, 47 years old, arrives after a car accident uh, with the Glasgow Coma School of 10 score. And as you see on the CT, there is a little bit, a bit of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and some little blebs or uh, bubble of air. And he had, some fracture of the skull base, um, especially of the left petrous bone, um, involving the, the even the carotid channel. Um, the next day, he repeated the, the CT scan. He was uh, uh, still intubated, and it the, up, appeared some ischemic lesion lesions on the left hemisphere hemisphere, sorry, and he did the city angel. I, I choose just some uh, images, not any images. And as you see, can you see my pointer or not? Yeah. Yeah. He, here, uh, it seems to be that the, the, the ICA is compressed or seems like this, maybe dissected. And later going up, the IC8 recover is um, normal uh, diameter. Uh, this is in the cavernous tract, and this is sort of tummy tract. So probably uh, in 24 hours, in the 24 hours, in the meanwhile, after the treatment, he had a stroke by the dissection of the, of the ICA. But at the moment of the diagnosis, the ICA was patent or just stenotic, and the old vessels of the left hemisphere were normal. Uh, so the patient was still intubated. We decided to do anything to leave the patient uh, recover. Um, I don't know if the anesthesiologist uh, put him uh, in the coagulation therapy. I don't know. But I know that one week later, they call because the patient progressively uh, developed chemosis, proptosis, and diplopia uh, on the left side, obviously. Um, and we repeat, uh, we repeat the CT angel. That shows this pouch here and a lot of veins in the left hemisphere. 
but uh, the most important things, the, the benchmark, uh, we, we saw a very big and large uh, superior of tamic vein, and even we could see the, the on the superior of tamic vein of the uh, contralateral side of the right side. So this is the sagittal view, um, quite the same, no more interesting. Uh, the pouch here, more or, more or less around the superior petrosal uh, sinus. And here was the angel. Obviously, um, it, was, it seems to be a, a carotid cavernous uh, fistula that doesn't develop immediately, but some days later and after the trauma. And this was the scenario, obviously, on the left side, the lateral view, in the right side, the AP view. And uh, the pouches here, here, late phase, superior of tamic vein, inferior of tamic vein. I think that I, I try to understand which type of vein is this, which the name of this vein. But uh, at the end, I, I, I suppose that it's a pouch of the uh, uh, the origin of the petrosal um, superior petrosal sinus from the um, cavernous sinus and the pterygoid plexus uh, of the both sides uh, cor coronal um, dural sinus and um, a, a draining vein in the in the brain uh, maybe the sylvian uh, vein. These are other projection, lateral view, AP view, right, and uh, oblique view on the right side, and oblique view on the left side. In the immediate arterial phase, as you see, there are, seems to be that there are some passages, not just a hole, uh, as usual. Mm, and, but it's difficult exactly to identify as usual uh, it's, it's difficult to identify a clear point of uh, uh, fistula. Late phase of the same projections. And we usually do the compression of the, of the carotid involved by the, the fistula. And here there is a, a common um, posterior communicating artery large, so we, we couldn't inject easily the, the fistula and this is the aspect of, of the fistula compressing the, the carotid so I, I, I want to ask you what, what would you have done in this uh, situation if someone want to say something or some suggestion because it's not a typical condition in my uh, experience uh, but up ah, I go on and so what what do you have done I shut up any, anyone <laughs> okay uh, Lucas so I guess we could say like um, broadly speaking like what the options are like yeah but are the options like we could say I guess is the option like deconstructive or reconstructive, right? Like somebody would yes. carotid, it or would you just like, you know, should we sacrifice the carotid and, and can we sacrifice yeah. the carotid, right? Yes, okay. yes. But there's also a third option, which is try, I'm not favoring that. I'm just saying a third option would be just to close the hole without uh, really reconstruct the vessel. Because here there's two issues. It's not just a carotid cavernous piece. I mean, it's, it's obviously a carotid cavernous fistula, but it seems really like uh, related to a, a trans a, a, like a, a whole a, a dissection, right? I mean, obviously, whenever there's a carotid, there a carotid cavernous fistula, there's a hole. But here, really, like it looks like the whole that whole like petrous cavernous segment is all dissected and abnormal. So um, uh, we clearly see like an intimal flap on this image in the right uh, upper right corner. Uh you can use, I don't know if you can use. Uh... Yeah, that one. Yeah, that is the, uh, it's a flap. He, he showed it very well on the CTA too. Um, so, um, 
you know, because when I when you, when you say reconstruct, I think of like also like take care of this dissection, which you know in, it is an option, right? You certainly want to close the the abnormal arteriovenous connection, but uh, then the question is, should you also reconstruct the vessel, like, and fixing this dissection or leave that alone? Yeah. What do you, and so. So I, I fully agree, Aiton. What would you? So we try to sacrifice the vessel, right? Is that like a, a way of talking? I don't know. It's it's not. Is it uh, so? Would you, based on the images you showed us, would you say the patient would be okay with a sacrifice of the vessel? In my opinion, probably yes. But obviously, I wasn't. I was not sure about it. Uh, because the compression couldn't do no no other neurological exam could be done to to understand it, and um, for me it 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 could tolerate uh, he could tolerate the occlusion of the ICA. I don't know your opinion. So you, uh, Aidan, you you will go certainly for uh, carotid occlusion with the no 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 I I I I I I don't I. I I'm not sure, based on what you showed, I'm not sure he would tolerate an occlusion. Also because uh, from the ICA, there is some anterograde flow into the, into the left hemisphere, right? When you inject the, the left ICA, right, there is mm -hmm. some anterograde feeling. So it tells me that there, even if there's a fistula, right, there is demand in that hemisphere that is not completely supported only by the collaterals. So, you know, and uh, yes, you showed some a PCOM, a good, uh, a good size PCOM feeling, but uh, you know, like it's it's really like it doesn't mean it's a pass because we would have to see like the delay in the venous phase, make sure it's not too late if it's under anesthesia. You know, if it's uh, if it's yes, and it's, it's, under anesthesia. So I'm not sure he would tolerate an occlusion. Okay, I would say that like when we see something like this. There are two possibilities. Like, let's say we want to sacrifice the vessel. So in that case, like number one, as Eitan says, number one, if you inject the left ICA and you don't see any flow beyond the occlusion, but you look at the head CT and you see that there is, like you saw, like a little infarct there, but like in general, there's no ischemia, uh, then likely the answer is yes, the occlusion will be tolerated. If we're not sure, then we'd have to do like a formal BTO, right? Uh, formal balloon test occlusion. Um, which uh, here, I, here it seems there's retrograde feeling, so probably he would tolerate. I'm, I'm, yeah, we, 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 we usually think that in carotid cavernous fistula, if there is retrograde flow in the fistula by the yeah. other communicating, probably we, we believe we am, I'm not the proof, but we believe that uh, it tolerates. Um, so we the obviously external, uh, the external. Yes, but I've not. Uh, you know why? Why I'm asking? Go, go back one image. Go back one image. You, no, that that uh, go forward. Sorry, go forward. Okay. The reason why I'm asking is because we don't see the ophthalmic artery. So I, you know, I'm wondering how is the ophthalmic feeling. That's why I asked for the external. But, but probably entering the fistula as the, the 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 from the posterior circulation the flow goes back to the communicating artery probably the I have not the images but uh, there was an, an entering of the um, of tiny artery in the fistula by the carotid yeah it, 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 it's an eventually effect <laughs> <I'm> joking <laughs> uh, I'm joking okay so I guess so back to your question right like what to do. Um, could, would anybody try to preserve this vessel? Um, yeah, and how? Um, so we can try the poll, like we have a little time. So maybe okay. we launch the poll and say, um, okay, A, sacrifice, whatever, somehow sacrifice B. Sorry, b before though, like I have a, an important question, which is how is the contralateral ICA? Like, is it completely normal? Like, no, we... no. Yeah, sorry, Aitan, you are right. Uh, the the right ICA sustain only the anterior cerebral artery. Okay, but is it a normal ICA, or he has any sort of like you know potential issue on that side too? What What do you mean? If like, there is a is there dissection, any other dissection, anything? No, like, no, okay. no, so, normal. Sorry. If you want, I, I will show you, I will. No, no, that's okay. But I think it's important because like- No, you know, no, no, no dissection, no stenosis, no, normal. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so I launched the poll again. I'm not sure if people are voting or there's some kind of technical issue. So A is preserve the vessel, B is sacrifice. Um, I okay. Should I vote? Me too. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> the result, I don't know if you can see the result. Uh, definitely, I think you should vote. <laughs> Uh, the uh, okay, so A was preserved to try to preserve the carotid artery, and B is to sacrifice the carotid artery. So, okay, so we're it's nine fifty six. In the interest of time, let me just share the results. So it looks like twenty nine people voted, and more people than not wanted to preserve the vessel rather than sacrifice it. Um, is it yeah? How old did you said? <laughs> 47 years old. Uh, I think it is interesting that more people, I mean, we all want to preserve the vessel, but then it opens the question of how. Um, yeah. That would be possible in the fistula of this size. Um, but, um, um, okay, so let's, okay, let's, I guess, look at, you want to, yeah, can I go, go ahead, let's further? See. Yes, I tried to draw the, the fistula, in my opinion, and uh, this is the um, two projections that use the same as here. As you see, there is a micro cat with a guidance catheter. So in our opinion, the point of fistula was here at the beginning on the oblique view and here on the lateral view. And there are some binging veins I don't know if they are, uh, that comes through this pouch that probably is the beginning of the superior petrosal sinus. And then I, 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 we suppose that the, the fistula was like this, but we are not sure about it. So in, that, in this moment, it was with Dodi, and we decided to sacrifice the, the, the carotid artery. So I did the wrong things in the, in the pool. And we, start, we decided to, to occlude the, the artery just uh, down above the, 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 the ophthalmic artery to here, to down. And so we start with, um, before without any uh, assistance of balloon, but just, but then the, the, the coils flow away in any directions and we start, we use a shatter and the, the, another micro cat with, the, I think an echelon, I can't remember. And we start to uh, release coil. This is the first one, just to show you uh, what we did. And it was a long uh, treatment. Uh, this is maybe the fifth one or sixth one. And we go back. I think that the cast was uh, good, very compact. And then a part of the coil went inside the, the, the point of that for us was the point of the section, the point of fistula. And this is the, the mask. And you see this strange bridge uh, towards the, the, the pouch. We continue. Um, we continue to, to, to feel the carotid as much as possible, trying to, to keep the, the coils compact uh, using the balloon. Again, other coils, other coils. And this is maybe uh, a run in the meanwhile, and we check, and the fistula seems to be still there, slower, obviously, but there are, yeah, we, we don't understand exactly. And now comes to, uh, Dodi went away and comes Amedeo, and we, we work together, because we, we couldn't understand in, in that moment if there was still a passage here in the petrosal bone, or exactly here. So we uh, continue to, to, to feel the carotid. We change the projection in AAP view uh, because we, we were uh, in the horizontal tract of the petrous bone. More coils. And again, the fistula was, seems to be slower, but still there. And at this point, look at the, the time. It takes two hour and a half uh, because we try to compact as much as possible the coils. And 
we, we, we were just a little bit confused because we think that, uh, we thought that occluding the, the ICA up and upper and lower respect to the, the suspected all, everything went uh, well, but it doesn't happen. So at this point, we stop on ourselves and we do uh, with another catheter, uh, an angio of the other vessels. So this is the uh, posterior communicating artery. And look at this little vessel. And, but no, 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 no signs of vistulas. Uh, this is the left side, as we saw at the beginning of the, the treatment. So no, no sign of fistulas. And this is the external. And obviously, the recanalization of the, the, the ophthalmic, the um, retrograde flow of the, the ophthalmic cavity that comes, came into the, into the fistula, especially into the pouch. At, at this point, I was really upset and disappointed because it seems to me that everything that we have done is completely unuseful and all maybe stupid. So we decided to, well, 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 no, I don't know. I don't say what we have decided. What do you have done now? Uh, can, can you go back uh, um, to that uh, P, uh, BERT injection? Um, the, the, yeah, but show, show the whole, uh, uh, the BERT, the BERT injection. Sorry. Yeah. So here, so, like you, you're pointing to that vessel. Like, uh, what is that? Yeah, yeah. That seems to be an, a temporal branch, no? Or is it related to the fistula? I don't know. I don't know. At the end, I, I think that it was maybe related to the to the fistula. Mm -hmm. That is like like we said before with the the topic of uh, the special uh, the. Um, the, the great topic of, uh, of Professor Krings, it seems to me that this is a vessel already there that goes into the fistula because it's a, a point of minor resistance and it calls to, to the... It's something to be a dural, uh, but it's not a dural because maybe, it's, maybe yes, um, uh, a dura recall but, uh, of, of a branch inside the, inside the fistula because there is a, an eye flow, an adventure effort that called the, the blood to come there because there is a sort of warm hole that uh, um, recall all the blood. Maybe a stupid things, but... No, I mean, uh, that's, that's a thought. I, I, I give as another option, I give that to be like, uh, you know, this is... That we need collateral flow there, and one of the collaterals to the right, to the left, yeah, uh, this, the MCA this. temporal division is through the inferior temporal division of the of the of the PCA, and very often it projects very there. Now we do see like some retrograde feeling from the PCOM all the way down, which tells me that uh, probably the coils were, and as you confirm from the ACA injection, the coils were not far enough uh, uh, or compact enough distally to 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 close the. The, the the hole from distally uh, that's that's my from the from the uh, sovraphthalmic tract you mean yeah if you, because if you show them the external injection and yeah. you go forward and you show the external injection yeah, right and here you see like keep going so we see the ophthalmic feeling retrogradely and now we see the fistula and it seems like there's there's the shunt comes from the ICA distal to your coil mass that's yeah. that's my my interpretation. Uh, 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 uh. And I'm happy of it because we thought the same things, me and Davideo, and we said, ah, we did the, the, the very stupid things. We don't close the ICA up there, but just above, down the, down the point of, the exact point of fish that we didn't understand anything, stupid guys. And so we decided to pass through the pecan and going there with the micro cats, the same, keeping the balloon inflated here in the ICA, just to see uh, how is the, the fistula. And at this point I said, oh yeah, I was a very stupid guy. The point of fistula was there and I didn't do the right thing. 
and maybe the trauma gives the the section of the all the ICA in the intra uh, intradural and extradural uh, uh, just above the, the the ophthalmic artery. So we start to deploy other coils from the sort of from the ophthalmic from the anterior knee of the carotid more and more. Now I don't know if two or three, and we did the uh, run. And this is the result. Are you happy? Yeah, very happy. No, you oh, have to bravo. go the left internal. <laughs> bravo. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we do the we, we do the left internal carotid injection. And again, the fistula was there. So again, we didn't understand anything. The pointer was here, but probably the 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 um, the flow of the blood comes from the ophthalmic to the anterior knee of the, the carotid and go down to the hole, ah, oh, sorry, here, and then into the pouch. So at this point, <laughs> was really upset again. Uh, no flow by the right carotid, no, no problems. So we decided to terminate the occlusion injecting onyx by the uh, um, the second microcath ear inflating the the balloon as a, a pressure cooker technique and as you see as you can see the onyx come back a little bit this is the stamp the the, the mask of the balloon but even it goes into the finally into the vein and into these stupid vessels like here. And if at the end the fistula is gone. So what what's the what's the <laughs> this is the, the, the final angel with the right uh, ICA injection, the posterior uh, injection with the PCOM still patent. Anything everything was good. And we finished like this. This is the MR after, I don't need to know it, five, four days later. Uh, the eye of the patient uh, recovered, except for the sixth nerve palsy. Maybe because the fracture of the cella of the clinoids uh, give compression of the sixth nerve, like here. Probably, uh, as you see in the, the first CT scan, the, you can see a fracture here. And it, the, the, the only symptom that it doesn't recover was the, the diplopia, but the, the eyes come back, the eye come back and was quite normal in a, in a week. Even the, the, uh, supra, uh, the superior ophthalmic vein were normal. These are the ischemic lesion uh, that uh, enhance after uh, injection of uh, cont in contrast injections and uh, the, the guy was discovered was discharged uh, uh, two or three weeks ago and he he went to the rehab in good condition um nothing this is the end and yeah they are, are you still there yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a hypothesis. Yes. Um, that uh, you coiled through the, um, the false lumen all the way. So mm. essentially, the true lumen, which was, all, which was compressed by the false lumen, like uh, uh, remained, uh, uh, remained patent, so it was feeling from retrogradely, it was feeling anterogradely. If you look at the final images, uh, like before the onyx injection and after onyx injection, Wait. Uh, I can't see anymore the. Why oh, can't see? Can you see again? Yeah, my... see your screen. We see your screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just, okay. Okay. Uh, scroll Tell through me. the before before onyx and after onyx injection. Mm -hmm. Yes, that image. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe you, see, you want. You see here yeah. how. Um, you see something, go back, go back one image. 
I think you have to right. read the presentation. Yeah, yeah, I understood. Just want to show you the, the mask. Gone or not? I have to go on. So this is uh, this is the final, right? No, go before before Onyx injection. This. Yeah, good. So you see you see how uh, uh, you see the coil mass in the petrous segment, and you see above that petrous segment you see like a line, right? Now um, uh, I believe in, that's at least that's a possible one of the possible interpretation is that's that's the the true lumen that is compressed by the coil mass in so, the in false lumen. So essentially, so you think that the, the section starts before? Yes, yeah, so this point. Yeah, so the, and indeed, when you, you see how the coil mass doesn't extend all the way there, but when you inject onyx from that position, it's gonna feel that. And you go, if you go to the next mm. image after onyx injection, you have the feeling of that, uh, of that, uh, uh, that line above, uh, above the coil mass. So you so, think that the dissection is like here? Yeah, so, or, and you know, the anatomy, the anatomy has changed after, after the, the coil is placed, but I believe yeah, that's yeah, one way of interpreting this. Yeah, but uh, 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 it's a very good point. Uh, I want to answer that for me, the reason of the, this very long treatment and uh, with some tricky maneuver uh, is that we don't do the right thing. Just we have to occlude the hole and then and the hole and the hole. So maybe when I was like, where is here with the coils, I have to push more coil inside here and inside here because for me the the, the point of the dissection, the point of fistula was here. Maybe you are right, but I think that the problem was solved when when the when the onyx fill this part of the of the vein or of the fistula of the dissection. I don't know and feel this part before was completely unuseful because the recall the the aspiration of the valve of the fistula was so high that it maybe i could occlude uh, with coils the 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 ica uh, down to the bifurcation but it won't occlude this fistula just feeling the vein occluding the vein occluded the hole i we solved the, the uh, we solved the, the the problem i don't know uh, obviously i'm no i'm not proof of it but uh, this is my point after a couple of weeks of thinking about it. Uh, I don't know if you agree or not. But yeah, I, I think so, but I don't know. Okay, anyone else have any theories? What do we think? Um, anyone? Um, Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I tend, I tend to agree with Eitan. I, I have the same, I mean, just from, based on what I've so far I've seen, I think that's one explanation. And it probably like, like if you think of Occam's razor, like, like what's the simplest explanation for that? Um, I think that's the simplest one because First of all, it explains like there's only one hole, right? Like originally, like when you saw, when you had some partial coiling and it was filling from the ophthalmic, like we can ask ourselves, is there another hole? Um, well, if there is, that would have to be very close to like the dural rings. Um, potentially, like it looked like maybe even an intradural hole, but it shouldn't be other because the guy is alive. Um, and, um, and so we know that there was a dissection, right? Like obviously, a lot of the history points to that. There was a dissection initially, then the dissection ruptures, uh, becomes a fistula, and that's well known. Um, so um, we know that's pre-existing, and we know that you'd like have a dense pack that goes down quite a ways, and yet the thing continues to fill. So either it's just filling through the coils somehow, or that the fact is that, the, as you show, like the majority of coils are not at the hole because they're in, in some, and I think the explanation is that they're in another channel. Like they're in a parallel channel, and there is a there is another lumen, probably the true lumen, that's backfilling the hole. And yes, of course, you're right. Like to close the hole, you close the hole. Like to close the fistula, you have to close the entire hole. And the onyx allows us to do that. 
um, I don't have any problem with what you guys did, like frankly, because I think that, you know, it's like, and maybe like others can comment, but um, even in a case like this, when you have a lot of coils and it looks like everything is anti-grade, like you have a lot of protection, like injecting a liquid agent into the carotid, right? Like it's, I think it's very, like you have to be super, super sure that the liquid's gonna go only where you want it to go. <laughs> uh, and so I think a lot, the coils that you had placed above the ophthalmic are just extra insurance before you onyx it or glue it. Um, I don't know if anyone has any, any more comments on that. I, I guess with, um, with flow, flow control, uh, he had flow control with a balloon microcatheter, so that certainly helped also. Um, and uh, you know, like so, and also as you said, closing, closing completely, closing off the vessel distally through the PCOM. But yes, I, either uh, so so either we think of these as two holes, or we think of one hole like filling integrated and retrogradely through, and that is uh, what we were thinking. Maybe a true lumen that was not. Uh, was just compressed and not completely closed. Yeah, I think now to go back, I don't know, maybe we're over time, so we probably should stop, but to go back to the reconstructive option, I mean, obviously having seen this, I can imagine how like trying to save this vessel would have been fairly complicated um, to my mind, but does anybody of the people that voted for saving the vessel, does anybody want to comment on like what the strategies might be, like how do you save this karate? Um, what 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 would be what would be do? Okay, all right. Um, okay, good, Luca. Thank you again. Um, thank you too. Oh yeah, uh, thank you, Timo. What went? He has, he has another meeting uh, to attend to. So. Um, we, you know, as a group, we thank him in absentia um, for a wonderful lecture. And uh, so the plan is, um, again, like, thanks everybody for coming. We, uh, next month, uh, next uh, Tuesday, I think it's September 1st, there is the next first Tuesday of the month, and we're going to have a talk on spine. going to have a, we have, like, basically the plan is to have a, a session covering uh, various aspects of spinal arterial anatomy and that naturally leads into some of the uh, more common spine conditions that we treat um, um, and that also has like another embryology perspective and whatever so anyway stay tuned uh, thank you if you want to contribute cases so like the format is that we'll continue with this format of lecture followed by an echo club um, type approach we have a, a case from Omar that We've held over. So, Omar, thank you. I will present that in, in September. Um, and so, if anybody else wants to contribute cases, please let us know. Uh, just email neuranger at neuranger.org and, uh, and tell us you're presenting. Okay, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good month. <laughs>